Purgatory Explained, Part 2, Chapter 61 Means to Avoid Purgatory, Blessed Margaret Mary and the Suffering Souls Among the revelations of our Lord to Margaret Mary on the subject of purgatory, there is one which shows how particularly severe are the punishments inflicted for faults against charity. One day, relates Monsignor Languet, the Lord showed his servant a number of souls deprived of the assistance of the Blessed Virgin and the saints, and even of the visits of their angel guardians. This was, said her divine master, in punishment for their want of union with their superiors and certain misunderstandings. Many of those souls were destined to remain for a great length of time in horrible flames. The Blessed Sister recognized also many souls who had lived in religion and who, on account of their lack of union or and charity with their brethren, were deprived of their sufferings and received uh, of their suffrages and received no alleviation. If it is true that God punishes thus severely those who have failed in charity, he will be infinitely merciful toward those who have practiced this virtue so dear to his heart. But before all things, he says to us by the mouth of his apostle St. Peter, have a constant mutual charity among yourselves, for charity covereth a multitude of sins. 1 Peter 4, 8. Let us hear Monsignor Languet again in the life of Margaret Mary. It is Mother Greffier, he says, who in the memoir she wrote after the death of the Blessed Sister, attests the following fact. I cannot omit the cause of certain particular circumstances which manifest the truth of a revelation made on this occasion to the servant of God. The father of one of the novices was the cause of it. This gentleman had died some time previous and had been recommended to the prayers of the community. The sister, the charity of Sister Margaret, then mistress of novices, urged her to pray more especially for him. Some days later, the novice went to recommend him to her prayers. My daughter, said her holy mistress, be perfectly tranquil. Your father is rather in a condition to pray for us. Ask your mother what was the most generous action action your father performed before his death. This action has obtained for him from God a favorable judgment. The action to which she alluded was unknown to the novice. No one in Paray knew the circumstances of a death and t- which had happened so far away from that town. The novice did not see her mother until long afterward, on the day of her profession. She then asked what was that generous Christian action which her father had performed before dying. When the holy viaticum was brought to him, replied her mother, The butcher joined those who accompanied the blessed sacrament and placed himself in a corner of the room. The sick, on perceiving him, called him by his name, told him to approach, and pressing his hand with a humility uncommon in persons of his rank, asked pardon for some hard words which he had addressed to him from time to time and desired that all present should be witness of the reparation which he made. Sister Margaret had learned from God alone what had taken place, and the novice knew by that consoling, by that the consoling truth of what she had told her concerning her father's happy state in the other life. 
Let us add that God, by his revelation, has shown us once more how charity covereth the multitude of sins, and will cause us to find mercy in the days of justice. Blessed Margaret Mary received from our Divine Lord another communication relative to charity. He showed her the soul of a deceased person who had to undergo but a light chastisement, and he told her that among all the good works which this person had performed in the world, he had taken into special consideration certain hum humiliations to which she had submitted in the world, because she had suffered them in the spirit of charity, not only without murmuring, but even without speaking of them. Our Lord added that in recompense, he had given her a mild and favorable judgment. Purgatory Explained, Part 2, Chapter 62 Means to Avoid Purgatory Christian mortification. The third means of satisfying in this world is the practice of Christian mortification and religious obedience. We bear about in our body the mortification of Jesus, says the Apostle, that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our body. 2 Corinthians 4.10 this mortification of Jesus, which the Christian must bear about in him, is in its broadest sense the part that he must take in the sufferings of his divine master by bearing in union with him the trials he may have to encounter in this life or the suffering which he voluntarily inflicts upon himself. The first and best mortification is that which is attached to our daily duties, the pains we have to take, the effort we must make to acquit ourselves properly of the duties of our state, and to bear the contradictions of each day. When St. John Berkman said that his chief mortification was the common life, he said nothing else than this because for him the common life embraced all the duties of his state. Moreover, he who satisfies the duties and sufferings of each day, and who thus practices fundamental mortification, will soon advance and impose voluntary privations and sufferings upon himself in order to escape the pains of the other life. The slightest mortifications, the most trifling sacrifice, especially when done through obedience, are of great value in the sight of God. Blessed Emily, a Dominican and prioress of the monastery of St. Mary at Vercelli, inspired her religious with a spirit of perfect obedience in view of purgatory. One of the points of the rule prohibited the religious to drink between meals without express permission of the superior. Now the latter, knowing, as we have seen, the value of the sacrifice of a glass of water in the eyes of God, was generally accustomed to refuse this permission, that she might afford her sisters an opportunity to practice an easy mortification but she sweetened her refusal by telling them to offer their thirst to Jesus, tormented by a cruel thirst upon the cross. Then she advised them to suffer this slight privation with a view of dismissing their torments in the expiatory flames of purgatory. There was in her community a sister named Mary Isabella, who was too prone to levity, being fond of conversation and other exterior distractions. The consequence was that she had little relish for prayer, was negligent in reciting the office, and only acquitted herself of this her chief duty with the greatest repugnance. 
Thus she was never in any haste to go to choir, and as soon as the office was ended, she was the first to go out. One day, while she was hurrying to leave the choir, she passed by the stall of the prioress, who stopped her. Where are you going in such haste, my good sister? she said to her. And why are you so anxious to get out before the other sisters? The sister, taken by surprise, at first observed a respectful silence. Then she acknowledged with humility that the office was wearisome to her and seemed too long. That is all very well, replied the prioress. But if it cost you so much to chant the praises of God seated comfortably in the midst of your sisters, what will you do in purgatory, where you will be obliged to remain in the midst of flames? To spare you that terrible trial, my daughter, I order you to leave your place the last of all. The sister submitted with simplicity, like a truly obedient child. She was recompensed. The disgust which she had experienced thus far for the things of God was changed into devotion and spiritual joy. Moreover, as God revealed to Blessed Emily, having died some time after afterwards, she obtained a great diminution of the sufferings which awaited her in the other life. God counted as so many hours in purgatory, the hours which she passed in prayer through the spirit of obedience. Diario Dominicano, May 3rd, Merv, 16. Purgatory Explained, Part 2, Chapter 63. Means to Avoid Purgatory, The Sacraments. Receiving them promptly. We have indicated as a fourth means of satisfying in this world the use of the sacraments, and especially a holy and Christian reception of the last sacraments on the approach of death. The Divine Master admonishes us in the Gospel to prepare ourselves well for death in order that it may be precious in his eyes and the worthy crowning of a Christian life. His love for us makes him desire ardently that we should leave this world entirely purified, divested of all debt toward divine justice, and that on appearing before God we should be found worthy to be admitted among the elect, without need of passing through purgatory. It is for this end that he ordinarily sends us the pains of sickness before death, and that he has instituted the sacrament to aid us in sanctifying our sufferings, and the more perfectly to dispose us to appear before his face. The sacraments which we receive in time of sickness are three. Confession, which we, we may receive as soon as we wish. Holy Viaticum and Extreme Unction, which we may receive as soon as there is danger of death. This circumstance of the danger of death must be taken in the broad sense of the word. It is not necessarily that there should be an eminent danger of dying, and that all hope of recovery be lost. It is not even necessary that the danger of death be certain. It suffices that it be probable and prudently presumed, even when there is no other infirmity than old age. See a pamphlet approved by all the bishops of Belgium and entitled The Medicine of the Families, Brussels, Mason, Jomer. The effects of the sacraments well received correspond to all the needs, all the lawful desires of the sick. These divine remedies purify the soul from her sins and increase her treasure of sanctifying grace. 
a fortify the sick person and enable him to bear his sufferings with patience, to triumph over the assault of the demon at the last moment, and to make a generous sacrifice of his life to God. Moreover, besides the effects which they produce upon the soul, the sacraments exert a salutary influence upon the body. Extreme unction especially comforts the sick person and alleviates his sufferings. It even restores him to health, if God judges it expedient for his salvation. The sacraments are then, for the faithful, an immense assistance, an inestimable, inestimable benefit. <clears throat> It is not, therefore, surprising that the enemy of souls makes it his first objective to deprive them of so great a good. Not being able to rob the church of her art sacraments, he endeavors to keep them from the sick, either by making them entirely neglect to receive them, or that they receive them so late as to lose all their benefit. Alas, how many souls allow themselves to be taken in this snare? How many souls, for not promptly receiving the sacraments, fall into hell or into deepest, the deepest abyss of purgatory? To avoid this misfortune, the first care of a Christian in case of sickness must be to think of the sacraments and to receive them as promptly as possible. We say that we should receive them promptly, whilst he is still in possession of the use of his faculties, and we dwell upon this circumstance for the following reasons. In receiving the sacraments promptly, the patient having yet sufficient strength to prepare himself properly, der derives all the fruit of them. He needs to be provided as soon as possible with the divine assistance in order to support his sufferings, to overcome temptation, and to sanctify the precious time of sickness. It is only by receiving the holy oils in time that we can experience the effects of a bodily cure. For well, we must here remark an important point. The sacramental remedy of the holy unction produces its, its effect upon the sick person in the same manner as medical remedies. It resembles an exquisite medicine that assists nature, in which there is still supposed to be a certain vigor, so that extreme unction cannot exercise a medicinal virtue when nature has become too feeble and life is almost extinguished. Thus, a great number of sick persons die because they put off receiving the sacraments until they are at the last extremity, whilst it is not unusual to see those entirely recover who hasten to receive them. St. Alphonsus speaks of a sick man who delayed to receive extreme unction until it was almost too late, for he died shortly afterwards. Now, God made known oh, by way of revelation, says the holy doctor, that if he had received the sacrament earlier, he would have been restored to health. However, the most precious effect of the last sacraments is that which they produce upon the soul. They purify it from the remains of sin and take away or at least diminish its debt of temporal punishment. They strengthen it to bear suffering in a holy manner. They fill it with confidence in God and assist it to accept death from his hands in union with that of Jesus Christ. Purgatory Explained, Part 2, Chapter 64, Means to Avoid Purgatory, Confidence in God. 
The fifth means for obtaining favor before the tribunal of God is to have great confidence in his mercy. In thee, O Lord, have I hoped. Let me never be confounded, says the prophet in Psalm 30. Surely he who said to the good thief, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise, well merits that we should have an unbounded confidence in him. St. Francis de Sales avowed that if he considered his misery only, he deserved hell, but full of humble confidence in the mercy of God and in the merits of Jesus Christ, he firmly hoped to share the happiness of the elect. And what would our Lord do with his eternal life, said he, if not give it to us poor little insignificant creatures as we are, who have no hope but in his goodness? Blessed be God, I have this firm confidence in the depth of my heart that we shall live eternally with God. We shall one day be all united in heaven. Take courage, we shall soon be there above. We must, he said again, die between two pillows, the one of the humble confession that we merit nothing but hell, the other of an entire confidence that God in his mercy will give us paradise. Having one day met a gentleman who was filled with excessive fear of the judgments of God, he said to him, He who has a true desire to serve God and to avoid sin must in no wise allow himself to be tor tormented by the thought of death and judgment. If they are to be feared, it is not with that fear that dejects and depresses the vigor of the soul but a fear tempered with confidence, and therefore salutary. Hope in God, who hopes in him, shall never be confounded. We read in the life of St. Philip Neri that having gone one day to the convent of St. Martha in Rome, one of the religious named Scholastica desired to speak to him in private. This lady had been tormented for a long time with the thought of despair, which she had not dared to make known to anyone. But full of confidence in the saint, she resolved to open her heart to him. When she went to him, before she had time to say a word, the man of God said to her with a smile, You are very wrong, my daughter, to believe that you are destined for eternal flames. Paradise belongs to you. I cannot believe it, Father, she replied with a deep sigh. You do not believe it? That is folly on your part. You will see. Tell me, Scholastica, for whom did Jesus die? He died for sinners. And now tell me, are you a saint? Alas, replied she, weeping, I am a great sinner. Therefore, Jesus died for you, and most assuredly, it was to open heaven for you. It is thus clear that heaven is yours, for as to your sins, you detest them, I have no doubt. The good religious was touched by these words. Light entered her soul. The temptation vanished, and from that moment, those sweet words, paradise is yours filled her with confidence and joy. Purgatory Explained, Chapter 55, Part 2 Means to Avoid Purgatory, Holy Acceptation of Death The sixth means to avoid purgatory is the humble and submissive acceptation of death in expiation for our sins. It is a generous act by which we make a sacrifice of our life to God in union with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross. 
Do you desire an example of this holy resignation of life into the hands of the Creator? On December 2nd, 1638, there died a at Rishak on the right bank of the Rhine, Father George Aquitinus of the Society of Jesus. Twice he had devoted his life to the service of the plague stricken. It happened that on two different occasions, the pest raged with such fury that it was almost impossible to approach the sick without being attacked by the contagion. Everyone fled and abandoned the dying to their unhappy fate. But Father Aquitanus, placing his life in the hands of God, made himself the servant and the apostle of the sick. He employed himself exclusively in relieving their sufferings and in administering to them the sacrament. God preserved him during the first visitation of the pest, but when it again broke out with renewed violence and the man of God was called upon for the second time to devote himself to the care of the sick, God this time accepted, accepted his sacrifice. When a victim of his charity, he lay extended upon his bed of death. He was asked if he willingly made the sacrifice of his life to God. Oh, he replied, full of joy, if I had a million lives to offer him, he knows how readily I would give them to him. Such an act, it is easy to understand, is, the very, is very meritorious in the sight of God. Does it not resemble that supreme act of charity accomplished by the martyrs who died for Jesus Christ, and which, like baptism, effaces all sin and cancels all debts? Greater love than this, says our Lord, no man hath, that a man lay down his life for his friend. John fifteen thirteen. To make this act in time of sickness, it is useful not to say necessary that the patient should understand his condition and know that his end is approaching. It is therefore to do him great injury to withhold this knowledge from him through a false delicacy. We must, says St. Alphonsus, prudently impart to the sick person the knowledge of his danger. If the patient endeavors to deceive himself with illusions, if instead of resigning himself into the hands of God, he thinks only of his cure, even when he receives all the sacraments, he does himself a deplorable wrong. We read in the life of Venerable Mother Francis of the Blessed Sacrament, a religious of Pampeluna, by jo Joachim of St. Mary, that a soul was condemned to a long purgatory for not having had a true submission to the divine will upon her deathbed. She was otherwise a very pious young person, but when the icy hand of death came to touch her in the flower of her youth, nature recoiled, and she had not the courage to resign herself into the ever-loving hands of her heavenly Father. She would not die yet. She expired, nevertheless, and the venerable Mother Francis, who received frequent visits from the souls of the departed, learned that this soul had to expiate her long suffering her want of submission to the decrees of her creator. The Life of Venerable Father Carafa by Father Bartoli furnished us with a more consoling example. Father Vincent Carafa, General of the Society of Jesus, was called to prepare death for death a young nobleman who was condemned to be executed and who thought himself condemned to, just, to death unjustly. 
to die in the flower of one's age, when one is rich, happy, and when the future smiles upon us is hard, we must own. Yet a criminal who is a prey to remorse of conscience may resign himself to it and accept it as a chastisement and expiation for his crime. But what shall we say of a person who is innocent? The father had, therefore, a difficult task to accomplish. Nevertheless, assisted by grace, he knew so well how to manage this unhappy man. He spoke with such unction of the faults of his past life and of the necessity of making sanctification to divine justice, satisfaction to divine justice. He made him understand so thoroughly how God permitted this temporal chastisement for his good that he crushed rebellious nature and completely changed the sentiments of his heart. The young man looked upon his sentence as an expiation which would obtain for him the pardon of God mounted the scaffold not only with resignation, but also with a truly Christian joy. Up to the last moment, even under the acts of the executioner, he blessed God and implored his mercy, to the great edification of all those who assisted at his execution. At the moment when his head fell off, Father Carafa saw his soul rise triumphantly to heaven. He immediately went to the mother of the young man to console her by relating what he had seen. He was so transported with joy that on returning to his cell, he ceased not to cry aloud, O oh, happy man, O oh, happy man. The family wished to have a great number of masses celebrated for the repose of his soul. It is superfluous, replied the father. We must rather thank God and rejoice, for I declare to you, to you that his soul has not even passed through purgatory. Another day, whilst engaged in some work, he suddenly stopped, his countenance changed, and he looked towards heaven. Then he was heard to cry out, O oh, happy lot, O oh, happy lot. And when this companion asked, him for an explanation of these words. Ah, my dear father, he replied, it was the soul of that condemned man which appears, appeared to me in glory. Oh, how profitable to him has been his res resignation. Sister Mary of St. Joseph, one of the four first Carmelites who embraced the reform of St. Teresa, was a religious of great virtue. The end of her career approached, and our Lord, wishing that his spouse should be received into heaven in triumph, on breathing her last sigh, purified and adorned her soul by the sufferings which marked the end of her life. During the last four days which she passed upon earth, she lost her speech and the use of her senses. She was a prey to frightful agony, and the religious were heartbroken to see her in that state. Mother Isabella of St. Dominic, prioress of the convent, approached the sick religious and suggested her to her to make many acts of resignation and total abandonment, abandonment of herself into the hands of God. Sister Mary of St. Joseph heard her and made these acts interiorly, <clears throat> but without being able to give any exterior sign thereof. She died in these holy dispositions, and on the very day of her death, whilst Mother Elizabeth Isabella was hearing Mass and praying for the repose of her soul, our Lord showed her the soul of his faithful spouse, crowned in glory, and said, she is of the number of those who follow the Lamb. Sister Mary of St. Joseph, on her part, thanked Mother Isabella for all the good she had procured for her at the hour of her death. She added that the acts of resignation 
which she had suggested to her had merited for her great glory in paradise and had exempted her from the pains of purgatory. Life of Mother Isabella What happiness to quit this miserable life, to enter the only true and blessed one. We all may enjoy this happiness if we employ the means which Jesus Christ has given us for making satisfaction in this world and for preparing our souls perfectly to appear in his presence. The soul thus prepared is filled with, in her last hour with the sweetest confidence. She has, as it were, a foretaste of heaven, the experiences which St. John of the Cross has written on the death of a saint in his living flame of love. Perfect love of God, he says, renders death agreeable, making the soul taste the greatest sweetness therein. The soul that loves is inundated with the torment, torrent of delights at the approach of that moment when she is about to enjoy the full possession of her beloved. On the point of being delivered from this prison of the body, she seems already to contemplate the glories of paradise, and all within her is transformed into love. Purgatory Explained, Part 2, Chapter 41, Motives of Justice. St. Bernardine relates that a married couple having no children, made a contract that in case one should die before the other, the one who survived was to distribute the property left by the other for the repose of the soul of the deceased. The husband died first, and his widow neglected to fulfill her promise. The mother of the widow was still living, and the deceased appeared to her, begging her to go to her daughter and urge in her her in the name of God to fulfill her engagement. If she delays, he said, to distribute, distribute in alms the sum which I have destined for the poor, tell her on the part of God that in thirty days she will be struck by a sudden death. When the impious widow heard this solemn warning, she had the audacity to treat it as a dream and persisted in her sacrilegious infidelity to her promise. Thirty days passed and the unfortunate woman, having gone to an upper room in the house, fell through the window and was killed on the spot. In Justice Towards the Dead, of which we have just spoken, and fraudulent maneuvers to escape the obligation of executing their pious legacies are grievous sins, crimes which merit the eternal punishment of hell. Unless a sincere confession and at the same time due restitution is made, this sin will meet its chastisement not in purgatory but in hell. Alas, yes, it is especially in the other life that Divine justice will punish the guilty usurpers of the property of the dead. Judgment without mercy to him that hath not done mercy, says the Holy Ghost in James 2.13. If these words be true, how rigorous a judgment awaits those whose detestable avarice has left the soul of a parent a better factor for months, years, perhaps even for centuries, in the frightful torments of purgatory. This crime, as we have said before, is the, is the most grievous because in many cases these sufferings which the deceased asked for his soul are but disguised restitutions. This fact is, in some families, but too often overlooked. People find it very inconvenient to speak of intrigue and clerical avarice. The finest pretexts are made use of to invalidate a last will and testament, 
which often, perhaps in the majority of cases, involves a necessary restitution. The priest is but a medium in this indispensable act, bound to absolute secrecy by virtue of his sacramental ministry. Let us explain this more clearly. A dying man has been guilty of some injustice during his life. This is of a more frequent occurrence than we imagine, even in regard to men who are most upright in the eyes of the world. At the moment when he is about to appear before God, his, this sinner makes his confession. He wishes to make a full reparation, as he is bound to do, of all the injury which he has caused his neighbor but he has not the time left to do so himself and is not willing to reveal the sad secret to his children. What does he do? He covers his restitution under the veil of a pious legacy. Now, if this legacy is not paid and consequently the injustice not repaired, what will become of the soul of the deceased? Will it be detained for an indefinite length of time in purgatory? We know not all the laws of divine justice, but numerous apparitions serve to give us some idea of them, since they all declare that they cannot be admitted into eternal beatitude, so long as any part of the debt of justice remains to be canceled. Moreover, are not these souls culpable for having deferred until their death the payment of a debt of justice which they had owed for so long a time? And if their heirs neglect to discharge it for them, is it not a deplorable consequence of their own sin, of their own guilt, guilty delay? It is true their fault that these ill-gotten goods remain in the family, and they will not cease to cry out against them as long as restitution be not made. Property cries out for its lawful owner. It cries out against its unjust possessor. If through the malice of the heirs restitution is never made, it is evident that it, that soul cannot remain in purgatory forever. But in this case, a long delay to his entrance into heaven seems to be a fitting chastisement for an act of injustice, which the soul has retracted. It is true, but which still abides in its efficacious cause. Let us therefore think of these grave consequences when we allow days, weeks, months, and perhaps even years to elapse before discharging so sacred a debt. Alas, how feeble is our faith! If a domestic animal, a little dog, falls into the fire, do you delay to draw it out and see your parents, benefactors, persons most dear to you? rise in the flames of purgatory, and you do not consider it your urgent duty to relieve them. You delay, you allow long days of suffering to pass for those poor souls, without making an effort to perform those good works which will release them from their pains. Purgatory Explained, Part 2 Chapter 42, Motives of Justice, Barren Tears. We have just spoken of the obligation of justice, which is incumbent upon heirs for the execution of pious legacies. There is another duty of strict justice with regard to children. They are obliged to pray for their deceased parents. Reciprocally, in their turn, parents are bound by natural right not to forget before God those of their children who have preceded them into eternity. 
Alas, there are parents who are inconsolable at the loss of a son or a dearly beloved daughter, and who, instead of praying for them, bestow upon them nothing but a few fruitless tears. Let us hear what Thomas of Camp Cantemperi Cantemperi relates on this subject. The incident happened in his own family. The grandmother of Thomas had lost a son in whom she had centered her fondest hopes. Day and night she wept for him and refused all consolation. In the excess of her grief, she forgot the great duty of Christian love and did not think of praying for that soul so dear to her. The unfortunate object of this barren tenderness languished amid the flames of purgatory, receiving no alleviation of his, his sufferings. Finally, God took pity on him. One day, whilst plunged in the depths of her grief, this woman had a miraculous vision. She saw on a beautiful road a procession of young men, as graceful as angels, advancing full of joy toward a magnific magnificent city. She understood that they were souls from purgatory making their triumphal entry into heaven. She looked eagerly to see if among their ranks she could not discover her son. Alas, the child was not there, but she perceived him approaching far behind the others, sad, suffering, and fatigued, his garments drenched in, with water. Oh, dear object of my grief, she cried out to him, how is it that you remain behind that brilliant band? I should wish to see you at the head of your companions. Mother, replied the child in a plaintive voice, it is you, it is these tears which you shed over me that moisten and soil my garments and retard my enter entrance into the glory of heaven. Cease to abandon yourself to a blind and useless grief. Open your heart to more Christian sentiments. If you truly love me, relieve me in my sufferings, apply some indulgences to me, say prayers, give alms, obtain for me the fruits of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It is by this means that you will prove your love, for by doing so you will deliver me from prison where I languish and bring me forth to eternal life, which is far more desirable than the life terrestrial, which you had given me. Then the vision disappeared, and that mother, thus admonished and brought back to true Christian sentiments, instead of giving way to a mother grief, <clears throat> applied to the practice of every good work which could give relief to the soul of her son. The great cause of this forgetfulness, this indifference, guilty neglect, and injustice toward the dead is lack of faith. For do we not see that true Christians, those animated by the spirit of faith, make the most noble sacrifices in behalf of their departed friends? Descending in spirit into those penal flames, they're, contem they're contemplating the rigors of divine justice, listening to the voice of the dead who implore their compassion they think only how to give relief to those poor souls and consider it their most sacred duty to produce for their parents and departed friends all the suffrages possible according to their means and condition. Happy are those Christians. They show their faith by their works. They are merciful and in their turn they shall obtain mercy. Blessed Margaret of Cortona was at first a great sinner, but after she had been sincerely converted, she blotted out her past disorders by great penances and works of mercy. 
Her charity towards the poor souls knew no bounds. She sacrificed everything, time, repose, satisfactions, to obtain their deliverance from Almighty God. Understanding that devotion toward the holy souls, when well directed, has for its first object our parents, her father and mother being dead, she never ceased to offer for them her prayers, mortifications, vigils, sufferings, communions, and the masses at which she had the happiness to assist. In reward for her filial piety, God revealed to her that by all her prayers she had shortened the term of suffering which her parents would have had to endure in pur purgatory, that she obtained their complete deliverance and entrance into paradise. Purgatory Explained Protestation of the Author In conformity to the decree of Urban VIII, Sanctissimum, Simum, Sanctissimum of March 13, 1525, we declare that if in this work we have cited facts represented to be supernatural, nothing but a personal and private authority is to be attached to our opinion. The discernment of facts of this kind belong to the supreme authority of the Church. Canon 30, Session 6, The Council of Trent, January 13, 1547. If anyone says that after the reception of the grace of justification, the guilt is so remitted and the debt of eternal punishment so blotted out to every repentant sinner that no debt of temporal punishment remains to be discharged, either in this world or in purgatory, before the gates of heaven can be opened, let him be anathema. <clears throat> Decree Concerning Purgatory, the Council of Trent, Session 25, December 4th, 1563. Since the Catholic Church, instructed by the Holy Ghost, has, following the sacred writings and the ancient traditions of the Fathers, taught in sacred councils and very recently in this ecumenical council, that there is a purgatory and that the souls there detained are aided by the suffrages of the faithful and chiefly by the acceptable sacrifice of the altar, the Holy Council commands the bishops that they strive diligently to the end that the sound doctrine of purgatory transmitted by the fathers and sacred councils be believed and maintained by the, the faithful of Christ and be everywhere taught and preached. Canons Concerning the Sacrament of Penance, the Council of Trent, Session 14, November 25, 1551. Canon 12. If anyone says that God always pardons the whole penalty together with the guilt, and that the satisfaction of penitence is nothing else than the faith by which they perceive that Christ has satisfied for them, let him be anathema. Canon 13. If anyone says that satisfaction for sin, as to their temporal punishment, is in no way made to God through the merits of Christ by the punishments inflicted by him and borne patiently, or by those imposed by the priest, or even those voluntarily undertaken, as by fast, prayers, almsgiving, giving, and other works of piety, and that therefore the best penance is merely a new life, let him be anathema. Canon 14. 
If anyone says that the satisfaction by which penitents atone for their sins through Christ are not a worship of God but traditions of men, which obscure the doctrine of grace and the true worship of God and the beneficence itself of the death of Christ, let him be anathema. Canon 15. If anyone said that the keys have been given to the church only to loose and not also to bind, and that therefore a priest, when imposing penalties on those who confess, act contrary to the purpose of the keys and to the institution of Christ, and that it is a fiction that there remains often a temporal punishment to be discharged after the eternal punishment has by virtue of the keys been removed. Let him be anathema. Chapter 9 On the Works of Satisfaction Session 14 The Council of Trent November 25th 1551. The Council teaches, furthermore, that the liberality of the divine munificence is so great that we are able, through Jesus Christ, to make satisfaction to God the Father, not only by punishments voluntarily undertaken by ourselves to atone for sins, or by those imposed by the judgment of the priest according to the measure of our offenses. But also, and this is the greatest proof of love, by the temporal afflictions imposed by God and borne patiently by us. <laughs>